In this episode, we talk to Dr. Nick Gordon about Jan van Eyck's Madonna of Chancellor Rollin, an exquisite painting from the 1430s. The work not only showcases what made Van Eyck such a revolutionary painter, it also gives us insight into the world of the Dukes of Burgundy, then Western Europe's richest dynasty. Hi, Nick. Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for coming in today, and what object have you chosen? Uh, Today I've chosen Jan van Eyck's Madonna of Chancellor Roland. And for people who are listening and who might not yet have seen an image of this painting. Can you tell us a little bit more about it, please? Sure. So the foreground of this painting, which takes up most of it, uh, is set inside a building, but it's not a church. We see there are, uh, they're in almost like a, an, arc- uh, an arcade of some sort with its uh, classicizing columns and arches. Uh, inside that arcade, on the left-hand side, there is a man who is exquisitely well-dressed, Uh, dressed in a way that shows his obvious wealth. He is shown kneeling with a book of hours on his knees and his hands uh, gestured in prayer, and he is looking up from his book of hours across to the right-hand side of the painting, where there is a uh, a Madonna uh, and child. Uh, The Madonna is covered in a very, very rich red uh, cloak or gown, uh, and a small angel hovers above her, bringing down her crown as Queen of Heaven, about to crown her with it. Then if we look uh, beyond the foreground, we look out through these arches uh, into a fantastically painted piece of aerial landscape, uh, where we see two figures standing on our bridge with their backs to us. We see a river working its way through the countryside, uh, and then we see details of a city on, on one side, and then more and more out into the countryside, into these soft blue mountains in the distance. This is, it's just a beautiful work with so much detail, but I know that some of Jan van Eyck's surviving paintings are quite small. So is this a large painting? Is it a small painting? It's a large-ish painting. Uh, so it's a, I suppose you could say it's a, it's a small altarpiece. Okay. The detail is certainly something I think that strikes a viewer when they look at this painting. I think also people would look at this painting and have questions about how space is working and how objects are placed in the space. And I suppose when it comes to Jan van Eyck, we also talk about him as having been quite a revolutionary artist. So maybe you could pick up on one of those threads to tell us a little bit more about the the painting. Sure. Uh, So there are a number of things, as you pointed to, about Jan van Eyck. Uh, that come to the fore, I think, in this work. Uh, So firstly, there is that extraordinary level of detail that he's able to create. And a lot of this detail is of the way light uh, reflects and refracts of different objects. So for example, if you look at the way the light is coming through the glass on the the window to the left behind the Chancellor, uh, if you look at the way the light plays on all the gold and silver embroidery over on his gown, the way the light plays on the jewels above the Madonna. Uh, Jan van Eyck was able to achieve this control of of light uh, by revolutionising how oil paint could be used. Uh, So we know that oil paint had been used since at least the 12th century, but mostly just for for, uh, ephemeral objects, outdoor flags, furniture, and that sort of thing. Uh, But Jan van Eyck, uh, we think, effectively creates a new process for using oil paint, uh, different ways of thinning it down to be, or making it into different sorts of glazes, different combinations. Uh, so we get this uh, amazing control of light and radiance of light uh, because he understands how light is moving through the layers of the paint to the background, the surface it's painted on, and then is bouncing off, uh, off that and coming back out towards us. So to get this effect, it's not just the paint going onto the layers of gesso behind it. He would also do things like kind of lay down gold and silver leaf over certain areas uh, and then paint over those. And that changes the quality of the light as it reflects through the layers of paint back out towards us. So is that that what's happening then on, say, the sleeve uh, of the man kneeling in prayer, that that that... um, 
surface that looks like gold is gold, but it's also gold incorporated into an oil painting. Uh, yes, exactly. It, it's both. Um, although we do, it can be quite tricky to tell which is which. So for example, in another work of his, there was an area which looks like it's gold leaf. It looks perfectly like gold leaf, uh, but they discovered while well, restoring it about 10 years ago that actually it's just paint that looks like gold leaf. So he's got gold leaf, he's got paint that looks like gold leaf, you've got paint over the top of gold leaf all going on. Uh, and that gives him the ability to control, uh, I suppose, if you're looking at the, the, the way, if you're looking at, say, gold thread embroidered in fabric uh, going over the contour of a body, it, it gives him the control to get all the gradients of light and shade, but also the different colours that will come out of that uh, if you're looking at it, if it were real. Light, light and shade is a beautiful element, I think, to pick out of this painting because, as you've said, there's that modulation of light from the shadowy darkness of the lodger that the the two figures, three figures, are sitting within, and then that extraordinary kind of blaze of light far on the horizon that almost leaches the colour out of those mountains and makes them that hazy blue. The objects. And by objects, I'm also meaning people in the foreground sit quite um, unusually in the space, I suppose, for those of us who are used to looking at painting from a couple of hundred years after this. And maybe you can touch on how space is working here. But you've, you've told us that that's Mary in the red cloak. And so we can safely assume that that's uh, Jesus sitting on her knee, blessing the male figure. You've referred to him as a chancellor, and this is the altarpiece you've told us of Chancellor Roland. So who is he? Uh, he was one of the most uh, effective politicians, I suppose, of the early 15th century. So he worked for the Dukes of Burgundy. He worked principally for uh, Philip the Fair of Burgundy. Uh, and he's working in the early 15th century as the right-hand man, as the person who has to make everything happen that the Duke wants to have happen. And Philip is very, very successful. He expands the Duchy of Burgundy uh, to an extraordinary amount, so much so that the Duchy of Burgundy, in his rule, is far richer than kind of uh, you know, he's the other branch of the family who are, are ruling pa France from Paris. Uh, it's also Chancellor Rouen who effectively uh, uh, removes Burgundy from that 100 years war. And Burgundy uh, is able to uh, fight um, both through playing with alliances with the English and the French and going back to having those two fight one another constantly, is able to profit from both. And that's also largely his work too. Um, so, for example, kind of by pairing these two neighbouring countries off one another, uh, he's able to kind of, uh, well, Burgundy is then able to kind of uh, sell luxury goods to both countries. Uh, so he's in his period, uh, Burgundy was the the richest of the duchies, the richest of the kingdoms on mainland Europe, um, and infinitely more wealthy than um, than the uh, the uh, than England at the time. So he is a very wealthy, very powerful politician who is the uh, the doer, I suppose, for the richest man in Europe in the 15th century at that stage. You've just you've said the words luxury and wealth um, a number of times, and you've described the Chancellor as exquisitely dressed. Material things seem very important, particularly in the foreground of this painting, from fabric to fur to glass-paned windows, which must cost a fortune, to the extraordinary detail on the crown that's about to be placed on the Virgin Mary's head the piles in the floor, the extraordinary puddling of great quantities of fabric around the feet of the two main figures in the foreground. Why is there this emphasis on materiality, not just in this painting, but really in Jan van Eyck's work overall? Is that something that he's responding to from what patrons want from him, or is that something that he had a reputation for being able to achieve? Why so many things? Uh, well, it's partly, I suppose, well, there are a few reasons. So, yes, it is the ones you mentioned. So, his patrons are mostly wanting to rep re represent themselves in their wealth. Uh, in this case, too, though, up, uh, in those little tiny freezes uh, above the Chancellor are uh, stories that are symbols of the of the deadly sins. 
Uh, so in that sense, it's also a reminder of kind of, well, there is worldly wealth, but you have to focus on something else. So it's, in that sense, it's a type of memento mori. Uh, what's happening in this painting is that the Chancellor is uh, at his morning prayers, looking over his book of, of uh, his book of hours, uh, and as he looks up, he has this moment of revelation where the uh, the Virgin and Child appear before him. Uh, so kind of it's they're not literally trying to show show them in the same room. They're trying to show a vision that he gets through his spiritual spirituality rather than his material goods. But there is nonetheless that wonderful kind of contradiction between showing your spirituality beneath all of this all of this finery. And the finery that's being shown in there is exceptional. So, for example, the reason why the Virgin here is in red rather than blue uh, is that the red fabric, the scarlet cloth, was far and away the most expensive fabric. So in that, it's also a symbol that despite these two figures being brilliantly dressed, uh, it's the one in red who is more important uh, because she is displaying a, gra uh, a greater abundance of uh, more expensive material. Which is again an interesting way of thinking of kind of for how do you show uh, the magnificence of the Virgin Mary? Well, you, you cover her in um, enough red fabric probably to you know, cover the floor of half a castle, um, and it's kind of an interesting an interesting approach to to doing it. But the things are also there uh, because the way perspective is being created in a work like this is not like how it's beginning to be done in Italy. So with linear perspective, which is being created in Italy at this time, you effectively create a box, a mathematical box, and you place all the people, all the figures in it. Whereas this is a different approach. This is a late Gothic approach to creating perspective, where your sense of perspective is created by having enough things in the space so your eye moves from one thing to the next thing, and that movement between the objects is what gives you a sense of space. So if you take these objects out, you don't have any space at all. Whereas if you say, look at an Italian painting by Masaccio, you take the objects out and you still have a mathematical space. And yet I, I see what you're saying when I look at the lodger here and I look at the objects within the space of the lodger, that kind of tilting of the floor, um, which seems to make them look like they're sliding down towards me and getting you know, really quite dramatically larger in proportion to the arch of the lodger that is behind them. So I see how here the objects form my sense of the space in the room that these figures are sitting within. And I can also see that maybe some objects in this room are more important than others. So a bigger, you know, the angel is a tiny little homunculus, but he's not as important as the virgin that he's crowning. When my eye travels beyond the lodger, however, to the scene beyond, I feel that space is being constructed in a different way again. So can you explain what's happening once we push outside of the space there within? Sure. Uh, yes, and it does. It's interesting that those these two methods create a, that sense of kind of uh, in, internal and external, kind of the internal foreground and the external background, kind of the inside and outside world. Uh, that meth technique that he's using there is aerial perspective, uh, and this is painted in 1435. So aerial perspective is being. Uh, practiced by painters in Northern Europe about 50 years before Leonardo da Vinci comes up with it. Um, so it's been around for a long time, even before Leonardo's born. So it's a, well, a method here that comes from very close, direct observation of the natural world. Uh, how things seem to change as they get further away from you. Uh, they start to lose their solidity. They start to become simplified. The colors start leaching out. The, uh, they become less saturated the further they are away. And when you look at the, this work or other of Van Eyck's work, when you look at it into the backgrounds, one of the things you notice is that he is very keenly observing how objects look in a different, a, from a distance. So if somebody is wearing, say, a multicolored uh, outfit, you can see all of those colors close up. But that same figure seen from, say, 100 meters away will just be turned into, well, that's one color of the shirt and another color for the pants. Uh, and that level of observation of the natural world is something that runs right throughout Van Eyck's work, that he is a very, very close observer of how things actually look rather than how things the theoretically look. So if we pulled in then um, with a really high-resolution, detailed image, if we could zoom in then on that scene that is in the um, in the background of this painting, what kind of things would we see there? It looks very highly observed. 
Uh, it is. So you've got the, uh, you find it there and with his other works, when you look for tiny details in the background, you find everyday activities, people trading, people chatting, walking through the streets, uh, animals around the place, uh, boats. Uh, you get these scenes of kind of daily life, the hustle and bustle uh, of the Low Countries uh, in the 15th century. One of the odd things, though, you see here, right in the very middle, uh, in that background, uh, are two figures, uh, two men, one wearing a big red turbany thing, which we think is probably a self-portrait scene from behind of uh, Jan van Eyck. And they're just both leaning, kind of elbow propped up against the wall of a bridge, and they're just having a chat while we have this apparition of the Virgin going on behind them. And that's a motif that would appear uh, later on in a work of um, Roger van der Weyden's uh, his St. Luke painting the Madonna uh, is a is a quotation of this work. But the timing of those two works is so close together that we think that the only way that van der Weyden could have known of, of this work was if he'd been inside Jan van Eyck's studio at the time. Uh, so despite them being the two dominant painters of the Low Countries, uh, it suggests that they actually get along and they kind of, they're, they're talking and kind of looking at each other's work. 1435, you said, is the date on this painting, and um, you've mentioned the van der Weyden painting of uh, St. Luke painting the Madonna that seems to be directly connected to this work. I can think of paintings by Memling or even by Italians about, you know, 25 years after this, the Poleolo brothers in Florence, for example, showing similar kind of hazy scenes beyond a window, even an arched window just like this. What's the long-term legacy of Jan van Eyck? Is it in that innovation of technique? Is it in the kind of um, motifs and stylistic models that he gives people? What is the the long echo of that painter? Uh, I think that's a very, very good question. I think he, it's mostly, I think, the technique that he develops for oil painting which, to be honest, isn't really rivaled by another painter for... Well, there are some, things, some of his works that you look at and they look impossible. Um, very, very few painters with oil have ever been that talented. Um, but it's the... So it is partly that legacy, but he doesn't seem to have been afraid to tell other people, show other people how to do it, um, which you think is probably why van der Weyden is kind of looking at his work and kind of he's gaining new things from him. Uh so he, we also know that uh, this technique is very quickly uh, exported uh, to to Italy, where it becomes revolutionary, first in Naples, then up around Venice, and then elsewhere, uh, and becomes the, I suppose in some ways, by the early 16th century, uh, so two generations after his death, uh, oil becomes the the dominant luxury me- medium. So if you really want to show something as being wealthy in paint, uh, you shift away from using or uh, well, things like our tempera, for example, uh, for using oil. And that's partly because it, oil allows you to show uh, a much greater richness of light, texture, tone, uh, and luxury. Well, thanks very much, Nick. You've given us something to go and have a really long, hard, close look at the next time we're fortunate enough to be visiting the Louvre. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy it. You've been listening to Limelight Arts Travels podcast, A Closer Look. It was recorded on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present.